So we learned last time about public, public speaking, really, about persuasion. Persuasion, or persuasive speaking, what was that? The act of what? Totally changing people because nobody agrees with me. The whole world's against me. Yeah, reinforcing or changing one's what? Beliefs, attitudes, values, or action, 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 action. Okay, so we all know. No, go to the other end. Were we supposed to use the um, the topics that you put in the email? No, no, those are just examples. I said I wanted you to investigate topics. So, yeah, no, you did not put those in the email. Um, unless you love them. But I wanted you to come up with your own topics to work on for the
now where we can narrow down the idea of persuasion to come up with one area or one topic. But instead of calling it the specific purpose or the point of persuasion, it is oftentimes referred to as what we call a proposition. So each of you who did vote on Tuesday voted for these different types of propositions that oftentimes is where we see this thinking most often. But what are propositions? A statement or assertion that expresses judgment, an opinion, good. Um, so for example, if I was reading through one of the propositions, is it an opinion or a judgment? If I was reading through like Prop 57. So if I get the, the pro-con list of mine, anybody get one of those? Like I'm just reading through what this is all about. What do those propositions do? What are they listed as? And if any is a statement or an assertion, that is correct. But they are urging you to value their policy. Do they just want you to be like, that was wonderful, and then set it aside, and then like to never look at it again? Support. support. And how are they wanting you to support this? They want you to what? Yes or no. They want to keep wanting it. They wanted you to what? Vote for it. They want you to take action on top of it, correct? And that's what it is. Those propositions are written for you to take action. But a proposition does not always have to be in this form of like policy or law, or like ah, all the written confusion. Think about what a proposal is when the chad got down on one knee. He asked me to marry him. He hoped that I would say no. He hoped that I would say yeah. yes. And a proposition, my friends, is what you want your audience to say yeah. yes to. At the end of your speech, you want your audience to be like, yes, that one. Yes, I'm going to do that. So it's what you want your audience to agree with you or say yes to at the end of your speech or at the end of your page. Does that make sense? Write that down on your little sheet. There. It should be one idea. A proposition cannot contain multiple yeses. We're going to say yes to one thing. Now, the reason that propositions are so confusing on the ballot is one, they're written from a legal standpoint, and they're written confusing on purpose because remember, if we can confuse somebody and make them confused and not educated on something, we can what? Yeah, like exactly. So there was this whole back in the day, there was Prop 8. I don't know if they were called Prop 8. California already had same sex marriage. We had pushed it through and um, legalized it. Prop 8 came on the ballot and was about same sex marriage. And <clears throat> it was written to say yes to Prop 8. And so if it's like Prop 8, same sex marriage, say yes. Those three things easily enough were people, what, believing that they were saying? Yes. Like, woo, same-sex marriage, yeah. But Prop 8 was written for you to agree to say yes to saying no. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so people were confused and in that space. So you can get people to say yes to saying what? No, I'm not doing it. Let's pretend that doesn't make any sense. But if you were like, I don't want people to smoke, that's people saying yes to doing that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Ah, but I get this too. So what do you want your, audi your uh, audience to agree with you or say yes to at the end of your presentation? That's what we want to come to. So an easy way, and an easy way to write this, because obviously you're going to simply bring down these two words to persuade, and then typically we have my audience put this in parentheses because depending upon your topic, you can in fact change this audience for the purpose of your speech. I'm fine, well, we are obviously a group of active thinking 
knowledgeable bodies who can, in fact, be changed by your speech. But are we always the agent that needs the change? And that's what I would encourage you to think about. So we spoke before about doing a speech like on um, like going to college and how that may not be the most effective thing because all of you are already what? In college. But there are other opportunities to speak. For example, Barack is a teacher in an elementary after school elementary program. Thus, if he wanted to, in fact, do that same speech, he could tailor that message to an audience of his specificity because, in that case, those individuals that he's speaking to are more agents that could make that choice rather than a teacher like me. Does that make sense at all? So if you're talking to a corporation, say like an enterprise like a student who wants to have a McDonald's uh, implementing a social responsibility program, and so to speak to us, that's fine. We can help you with this message. But in turn, the most important thing we're going to be able to speak to is what you can do. McDonald's is such, right? So to persuade, so I think of what my audience is going to be us as college seniors, the people who are in front of you, or we can tailor this to a specific group, depending upon who is going to be most affected by this particular piece. So to persuade my audience, and then remember, we don't ever want to use the word what? Why do we not want to use the word what? It's informative. Okay. This is informative. You can never persuade somebody about anything. You can inform somebody about anything, but you can't persuade somebody about anything. For example, to persuade my audience about social responsibility at McDonald's. Right, there's a stand sign. Now it goes back to being this idea of informative. And so, by setting ourselves up with a word like that, instead of about, it will urge that whatever comes after it is a factual statement or, um, or the chance of the action that it will come to. So, you had an assignment to read um, about three different types of what they call them questions. And because those questions, so typically in persuasion, right, like if you're going to write a research paper, for example, or if you're going to write a persuasive paper, they tell you to come up with a question. And answering that question will oftentimes give you the uh, thesis to your paper. So they call them questions. But in this case, we're going to call them propositions for our purpose. But the same idea is for the definitions they use are the same. The questions of fact and value policy are the same as the propositions of fact value policy. Because fact value policy are all the same. So let's think about what fact value policy means. So what do you understand fact to be? Right? Oh, actually, I'm so sorry. Let me put this. Let me make sure that I do. So your proposition, I think we got that. So really quick, right back at the top, right under the proposition. <clears throat> it says, depending upon your proposition, you will organize your main points accordingly. And hopefully you understood that not only from Tuesday, but maybe from the reading. This organization is going to give you the most effective and organized way to communicate with your audience. So if you have a proposition of fact, you're going to organize your main points in one way. If you have a proposition of value, another way. Policy, there's two different ways that we can do it, depending upon the policy that you are asserting. So what I want each of you to do is to take some time and kind of remember what all of these propositions were. So on the sheets in front of you, what I'd like you to do is look through the individuals or look at the individuals' propositions. Did these individuals write next to it a idea if they had a fact value or policy? Yes. Oh good. If they 
didn't, then you may not have been aware of what you have. So let me go ahead and try to describe some of that fact value policy. Why don't we turn to the propositions of fact first, and that is on page 34. And let's go over this criteria. So what are propositions of fact? Okay, so you said smoking is bad for you. Now, what we've come to learn, and does anybody want to tell me why that may not be a fact? It would be a, it would be a bad thing. Why would it be a bad thing? Clara. It can cause a worse condition to the body. Yeah. It is? A what? Some of the air from inhalation. Yes. Why is it a fumer? What gives you that information? Different ideals will converge. If we wanted to flank our ideas about smoking, which we will, and we just put up the topic smoking, and we put this in front of you, a cue persuades my audience that smoking, we now say, Is the smoking effect pretty tough? <laughs> Isn't it just a statement? Or we could be narrowed in any way, shape, or form. What is the what is the uh, what is the unstable word? The tough. The tough. Okay, good. Three minutes of smoking. Solar energy saves money because within the solar energy 
pocket. There is still a debate on whether or not this is a short-term money-saving thing or if it's a long-term. We have to put out a lot of money up front. How much are we going to get back, right? Is it ever going to pay off? Does it actually cut your bill? Are you rethinking? So this question now, or this proposition, is going to try to assert one side as being the truth. So for the idea of smoking, is there an opposition to the idea of wanting to smoke? We still don't know the effects. If we put even the, that it negatively affects one's health, is there an opposition to that? Is anybody going to be like, no, smoking? No, but I mean, yeah, sure. Like, if um, smoking reduces stress, <clears throat> um, and you wanted to, I wouldn't ever recommend like, one as an allowance for someone who's like, I'm going to be able to do some smoking. Really, like, right? Like, have a glass of wine if you feel stressed. It's a great scapegoat. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes she just had to like throw up before a first presentation because she was so nervous. So throwing up makes her feel better. <laughs> so do you know what kind of scapegoat like you're creating? Like are smoking because of stress, and they're like, I can't give it up, it reduces my stress, if that's the belief, then you could emerge a proposition or back out of that to persuade my audience that smoking does not reduce stress. So great, it's a great easy five minutes that we can lay out for our audience if we want to, if we get evidence as to how that thought process is in that makes sense to y'all? So let's look at the other ones here that we have as well. Uh, the government is withholding information on UFOs. I'm saying that one for years. <laughs> We're going to talk about, and so this is going to try to prove to you what? That UFOs exist? No, that's not what this is claiming. This is claiming that what? The government is hiding UFOs. And I'm going to tell you the different ways that they're hiding UFOs. And so through that, will we automatically We wouldn't be persuading our audience that, but it may be an indirect result of this may be something as well. Neil Armstrong was the first man to step foot on the moon. This is a debatable topic because there's a whole existing strain. There's a whole existing strain. Why can't I think of it? Of discourse that revolves around him not. Death is inevitable. Um, in this case, some people would say, sure, a physical death, but maybe not a spiritual death. And so we can play that, that angle with you a little bit. Obesity causes health problems. Right? Um, yeah, so we can look at this idea also, like what we consider obese, right? Is that really where the effects are? Uh, exercising every day is beneficial to one's overall health. Okay, we can totally persuade that people still are, you know, like 100% certain that exercise is going to help. There are other elements that's like, no, comes to find out exercise and, and eating well doesn't have heart anymore. I'm gonna buy again. But you could do something to that extent. So if you're going through, and why don't you go through this friend's side 
And so they bring out the five, and then for the three that they decided to take on, if you read their claims, were you able to identify any of theft from them? And you may not be able to decipher quite yet, because we may need to go on to the next one. However, so look for those, see if you think you have one of fact, but let me tell you briefly about how propositions of fact are organized. Propositions of fact are organized topically. This is the same way that you think we are speaking until now. Each of your main points, each of your main, so if you want to say propositions each of the main points, so you want Roman numeral one or Roman numeral two, or three, four, five, however many you decide to have between two and five, are going to be claims that are also facts. They are going to emerge out of the evidence that you start to research on your topic. So if we were talking about the claim of, if you wanted to go with even um, exercising every day is beneficial to one's overall health. My main points are going to be to persuade you that what? Like they're going to be grounded in different ways that what? Exercising benefits your overall health. So how does exercise benefit your overall health, everyone? So we can, it's not going to tell people how to power exercise and start exercise. But we can say something like, to persuade my audience that, you know, exercise is beneficial to their health. And then for your thesis, all you are going to do, the thesis is a combination of your central idea, but now this is known as your? Okay, good. So it's just a proposition plus your main point. So in this case, to persuade my audience that exercise is beneficial to, to your health, I will describe how exercise benefits one's I guess it says benefit one's health. Yeah, sure, that's the whole thing. But what parts of health do we want to talk about? Oh, fun! Mental health, that's fun. Okay, well now we only have two main points. Right? So you can do it that way if you want to do it. First talking about how it is to pursue your mental health, and then talking so I can do that. And is everybody saying this for mental health? Because I know there's certain and then two would be physical health. Or you could concentrate solely on absolutely persuade my audience that exercise is beneficial to your physical health. I will describe how it benefits your what? Heart. And how it benefits your Okay, great. So that's another topic. <laughs> so that can be a whole other one as well. To portray my audience that exercise reduces what? Risks of disease. And you can say it reduces heart disease, it reduces cancer, and it reduces Alzheimer's. Great. One count? This is all fun. So we're just, let me just finish this one. We can do like five more. Something like this. So there's many different numerous ways that you if you note, each of these are going to be claims that support this idea of overall health. Mm -hmm. The government is secretly hiding UFO things. I don't know. What, what was that topic you said? They're withholding information. They withheld. So then you'll give us two to five topics of how they what? Or what they're withholding by first. Explaining how the government is withholding information about the landing of the spaceship in 1968. They are withholding information about the aliens that they have stored at Area 51. I don't know. Does this make sense? Whatever your head is. Each of these things you better 
understand how this main topic may organize and how making each of those main points is going to be the direct result of whatever your findings are, the ways that it does in fact benefit one's household, that they are withholding information, the reasons to why the team should not come in on the meeting, the reasons as to why whatever happened to them is clear to everybody. Okay. Now in contrast, or in addition to, we also have a proposition of value. And a proposition of value is a little bit different because a value argument isn't one that will oftentimes be heard in the public sphere. And I only say that because a value is a very um, can you finish your thought? Why not? Can you just finish your thought? Oh, you don't know what I thought. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> um, we're actually, so are we choosing between the three of the facts, what uh, value or quality is what you want to choose between, or do you want to choose between? Depending upon how your proposition is written. That's why I say come up with what you want to talk about first. Don't just think about it all. Like, we'll figure out where it sits. I want you to be like, this is what I want to say about it. So yeah, like that's why I had to do that discussion first, and then come to your decision. Yeah. So we will be choosing between the fact value policy, uh, and not like choosing, but your proposition will be. You will only be the way that you write your proposition. Okay, so if, um, like for example, the person that's trying to do like as one place blah blah blah. So for example, if it is, oh, and I'm so sorry, hon, that you did this one because this one was about the ones that I gave. But let's say that um, this was her claim, right? That's a proposition of. Why do you say value? It is something that has been proven, and all of you have an opinion. These are all your opinions, but they come from somewhere, right? It's not like you just said, because I said so. You've garnered these propositions based upon your own opinions about the topic. So a value, for example, well, let's talk about this. So like, what is a, a value speech, if you will? Uh, these propositions are going to consider and will have the words in them. They're going to help them make. They will have the words good, bad, right, wrong, moral, learned this when we studied ethics. Ethics, the branch of philosophy that deals with what is right, wrong, good, bad, moral, immoral, just, unjust. If you remember, we had Felicia Robinson, that woman who was running the school board, and each of you came up with like a yes, she should, or no, she shouldn't, or we all had different reasons as to why. Well, that's because our criteria when we make a decision on something is based upon our own personal ethical standpoint. And those are what we determine to be good. Like, oh, right, wrong, and so when you say something is bad, what does bad mean? For me, for example, I think I talked to you, did I tell you about this one? We talked about this one already, like with the best cheeseburger. Best cheeseburger in California. Great! Now, in and out is the best cheeseburger in, in California because, <laughs> because it's delicious. Fantastic. Okay? And Five Guys is the best because and what was the answer? Howard? Is how why is Howard the best? 
good news. All right. These three people have a different criteria of what means best. So have you ever sat around saying, no, Goonies is the best children's movie. And somebody's like, no, The Sandlot is the best children's movie. And then somebody else is like, no, Lion King was the best children's movie. You're probably all right. Why? Because they're all good movies. Because they're all good movies. Because they are all good movies. <laughs> but the reason that you asserted that word was because you have an understanding of what the word, the, the, the best, best so the thing with the value is that we, people oftentimes do not come to a, a decision on value because they realize that they're arguing two different things to begin with. That's a big thing about value is that when people start to talk about like this is the best marriage, somebody's going to be like, it's wrong. And you're like, it's wrong. But they're wrong to be like, it's wrong because for me, biblically, it's wrong. And the other thing is, it's wrong because the sanctity of marriage should be between a man and a woman. And the other person is like, it's right, because they believe in equity, right? So it's like, what are we even arguing? So the issue with the value is that the first important thing is that if you're ever arguing with somebody about a value, get them to define that value so you know what the grounds that you're arguing on are to begin with. Because you're like, oh, now I have to like reshape my whole entire position. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't know that. We, we were looking for something with more ingredients. I'm sorry, I thought we were looking for quality or just tasting delicious. So now we're talking about something simply having more ingredients. All right. Maybe then it's not is the best word. Does that make sense? So what the proposition of value establishes is that we first have to define our criteria of the value, and then we show how our proposition fulfills that test of making it right. Does that make sense? So oftentimes this can be done in two different ways. It can be done topically. Yes. So if what is that example? If somebody start reading out some
Andy Wolf. Can you say why America is the greatest country in the world? Diversity and opportunity. Both uh, freedom and freedom. So let's keep it that way. Well, why is not the greatest country, country in the world, Professor? That's my answer. You're saying yes. Let's talk about bias. Let's share it. The NEA is a loser. Yeah, it accounts for a penny out of our paycheck. But he can take us away at any time he wants. It doesn't cost him money. It costs bulbs. It costs air time. It costs column inches. You know why people don't like liberals? Because they lose. If liberals are so fucking smart, how come they lose it? Goddamn always. Hey, and with a straight face, you're going to tell students that America is so star spangled awesome that we're the only ones in the world who have freedom. Canada has freedom. Japan has freedom. The UK, France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Australia, Belgium has free. So, 207 sovereign states in the world, like 180 of them have free. All right, and yeah, you, uh, sorority girl, just in case you accidentally wander into a voting booth one day, there's some things you should know. One of them is there is absolutely no evidence to support the statement that we're the greatest country in the world. We're seventh in literacy, 27th in math, 22nd in science, 49th in life expectancy, 178th in infant mortality, third in median household income, number four in labor force, and number four in exports. We lead the world in only three categories. Number of incarcerated citizens per capita, number of adults who believe angels are real, and defense spending, where we spend more than the next 26 countries combined. 25 of those are allies. Now, none of this is the fault of our 20-year-old college student, but you, nonetheless, are without a doubt a member of the worst period, generation, period, ever, period. So when you ask what makes us the greatest country in the world, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Yosemite?
then in this case, your main points are going to be all facts that are going to be to prove that this value is in fact true. So if you said America isn't, so for example, if I said my for a proposition was to persuade my audience that America is not the greatest country in the world, I will first describe how America America is least in the general population. How America is least in their whatever. Right? Yeah, like how we're the you know, no one thinks of Russia as a country. Or you can put it like that. Um, or you can do it in the opposition way. Well, let's frame it. to know this. If you want the audience to take action, so to persuade my audience that they should do blank, to persuade my audience that they should law, like any of those, you know, you should. Persuade my audience that they should not. Persuade my audience to volunteer. To persuade my audience to give blood. To persuade my audience to drink water. To persuade my audience that Whatever it is, that is a proposition of policy that is, is encouraging the audience to take action. Does that make sense? There are two different formats to organize propositions of policy. If you are addressing a truth in your policy, or if you are, sorry, addressing a current or existing law, way my audience that um, abortion should be legal. You are addressing a specific law, and thus it is best organized in one fashion. However, if you are addressing your audience to persuade you to exercise, to get you to try this product, to get you to go out and buy this book, to watch a certain TV show, whatever it would be, a different format is that small piece of paper that I gave you that Maslow's. That is what that hierarchy of needs is. And I will go through each of those in detail as to how they are organized. It's really easy. But it is based upon problem, cause, solution, essentially, and then the other is the hierarchy of needs. And I've already laid out those main points for you. So because I want to give you credit for doing this assignment, if any of you did not save your work and would like to take a photograph of it so that you can take that home with you, uh, why doesn't everybody pass that homework back forward to me? Uh, and then what I want you to, oh, that's right. And then what I'll have you do 
you can of course come up and grab like search through you. Oh, no, I need yours because I'm gonna grade it. But if you want to take a picture of yours, you got it. Okay. Do you want me to pause them, please? Go ahead. Let me pause.